Today in the land of Chess Kid Utubia, we're going to talk about the dangers of focusing only on one part of the board. Hmm. Now, you wouldn't do that if you were watching television. You'd have the Roadrunner, but no Coyote. Wait, do kids even watch television anymore? I meant to say iPad. Let's take a look at this game that I played recently on one of my Beat Fun Master Mike shows. And here, I'm white. I could just castle and play a reasonable game, but I remembered my old chess lesson. I recorded it a couple of years ago. It was called Tactics on F7. And you know what? I was so intrigued at Bishop Takes F7 that I played it. I just didn't give it as much thought as I would have liked. Now, often tactics on this pawn happen when this knight comes to D7 because it blocks the bishop. Blocking the bishop weakens the E6 square. When you take that pawn on F7, it also weakens the E6 square. And let's just get into it. Let's play bishop takes F7, king takes F7, and now the usual follow-up is knight to G5 check. So I played it. Now, this is the tricky part. There's actually four legal moves for black. We're going to quickly talk about why king to g6 is bad. Well, I'll just tell you. This knight comes to f3, and good luck stopping this knight from coming to the square h4, and black is totally toast. So we're just going to end the analysis there. Okay, let's go back to this position. Now, king f8 is also pretty easy to defeat. Knight e6 forks the king and the queen. White leaves a very, very happy camper. Now, amazingly, you wouldn't even believe this, but black can hold the balance, maybe even be slightly better, by going to g8, which seems totally crazy, because after queen check, it looks like when the king moves here, we're just going to deliver a mate on f7, the old queen and helper mate on the weak spot. But somehow black survives with knight to d5, really the only other legal move. And if you take the knight, black can play the in-between move knight c5, recapture this pawn with the pawn, get the snow plow. And honestly, if my opponent finds that, my opponent is just a huge genius. So we need to go back. What my opponent actually played was the move king to e8. And now we're going to talk about my mistake. I was only focusing on this square and a little bit on this square. I'm only focusing on the right side of the chessboard. Now, I could hop the knight in right away. And when the queen moves, I could like pick off a pawn. And that's kind of what I saw. I'm getting two pawns for the piece and I wasn't quite sure if it was enough. So what I actually played was queen b3. Now, even though my queen is moving to the left, I'm really focusing on the right, right? That's a checkmate on that square. And if my opponent decides to move the queen to give the king some loft, then I made in two. I just give check. And when the king moves, I deliver a checkmate. Okay, let's go back. So I had that covered, but my opponent has one other idea. My opponent can actually move the rook over to the square f8, which is what was played in the game. And then I played knight here thinking I was getting some material back, but my opponent hit me with the moon knight c5. And actually black is doing really, really well in this position. Okay, I wanna go back. I'm not gonna focus on how I played wrong. I could do entire videos on that. Hmm. I think I already have. What I do wanna focus on is board vision. Remember how pretty much this entire time we've been focusing on this square and on this square. And basically, if I would just draw like a little box, we're focusing on one quarter of the chessboard. However, if I had had better vision and looked at the entire board, I may have found one of the most unbelievable tactics that I would have ever played on my show, which is, drum roll, can I get a drum roll? Can I make it louder? Okay, now soft. Okay, now louder. 96. Okay, you're thinking that's not that special. In fact, by itself, 96 is not that special, but here's why it is special. When the queen moves, she has two safe squares, this one and this one, and no matter which one she picks, I'm gonna play the same follow-up. When the queen moves, I'm not gonna focus on the right side of the board. I'm not gonna take a pawn. I'm gonna play the move knight c4, and look at this. One of the most amazing queen traps in history. This queen is trapped by both knights. This knight attacks that square, this one that is. This knight keeps the queen out of that square, and of course, this knight keeps the queen out of these squares, and right now you're wondering, but what about if the queen moves to this square or this square? It doesn't matter which one she picks. Then we have Fork Town population my king's knight on c7, I win the queen. And by the way, if we go back, if the queen had chosen the other move, queen a5, knight c4, and it's all the same tactics, I don't even really have to repeat myself. If the queen goes to here or goes to here, Fork Town uh, population is still the same. It's the King's Knight occupying C7. He's the mayor of Fork Town, and we win the Queen. Was I looking at the left side of the board at all? No, I was not. If I had been looking at the left side of the board, I may have found this tactic. Although it was a blitz game, it's a weird tactic. Two knights surrounding a queen, not so common. But it is a good lesson that if you just look at one side of the board, you're going to miss half the action. And in this case, I missed a brilliancy, but maybe it brought a smile to your face knowing that it could have happened 
happen. I just wish it would have happened. Okay, chess kids, look at the whole board and you will double your level.